Hallelujah. 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 God, we thank you for being everything. We thank you for being our protector. We thank you for being our provider. We thank you for life, health, and strength. God, we thank you for being everything. Bridge over troubled water. Lawyer in the courtroom. Doctor in the sick room. God, thank you for being everything. God, we lift our hands today and we give you glory and we say thank you. You've been our master. You've been our savior. God, we say thank you. You've been everything to us. Hallelujah, God. Hallelujah, God. We do not take it for granted that you have been everything to us. Can we just take about five seconds to say, God, thank you for being everything. Even when we didn't know what was next, we still knew that you were God. And because you are everything, we don't have to worry about anything. So God, we bless you. We magnify you. And we adore you. Come on all over the building. Come on, put those blessed hands together. Amen. Amen. Why are you still clapping? Can you do me a favor? Amen. God has elevated and promoted Lance. Amen. And this is his last day with us. Can we just show him some appreciation? Can we just thank God for his faithfulness? Amen. For all that he has done for this ministry. We appreciate you. I told you on yesterday, I said in front of everybody else, a lot of what you've seen during this pandemic, he has been a major part of it. So we say thank you. We salute you. We bid you God's speed, and we just believe that everything God has promised you is going to every prophecy, is going to every promise is going to come to pass. I'm looking forward to all that God has for you and to see you walk in that blessing. Come on, one more time. Let's thank God. Amen. Amen. We send you with the blessings. Amen. This is what transition is supposed to look like. Amen. We're never in the business of trying to hold anybody back. But we are looking forward to what God has for him. Amen. Can you help me thank God for our music ministry as well? Amen. 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 We have with us today Minister Christopher Grace Sr. God bless you, sir. Thank you so much. Amen. Let's not forget Brother Will Gillespie over on the base. Filling in for Corey, God bless you all. And then we can't leave you out, Chris Grace uh, Jr. And AJ. Amen. We would be remiss not to praise our own. Amen. God bless you uh, for your faithfulness. Amen. Amen. There is a word from the Lord. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Psalm 119. We don't plan to be before you long. If you're looking for something deep today, uh, join us Wednesday. I don't have anything deep today, just relevant. Psalm 119. Uh, I, I know what I gave you back there, but let's just go to 67, please. 67. Psalm 119, 67. There you go. If you have your Bible, say amen. If you don't have it, say, uh, don't ask me to say nothing. <laughs> we love you enough that we have it on the screen for you. And I promise you, uh, I'm not going to wait on anybody to turn there because by the time you get there, we're done. Before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now, I have kept thy word. Let's pray. Father, we thank you now. 
for this day, for this is the day that you've made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. Father, we thank you for another opportunity to assemble ourselves one more time in this sacred place that we call the sanctuary. God, not just here, but even in our virtual sanctuary. God, those that are streaming with us. God, we thank God that we are all assembled and we are waiting to hear a word from you. So, Father, speak now as only you can. Speak with clarity, Lord, to the point that if there's one here today that does not know you in the free pardon of their sins, that you would convict, convince, and persuade right now in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, help me to teach and to preach your word today with the Holy Ghost boldness, but not with an arrogance. Hide me now behind the cross so that the people will see none of me, but all of thee. Now may the words of my mouth, meditation of my heart, be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, you are my strength and my redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. One more time. Before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now I have kept thy word. This morning I want to speak to you from this simple topic. Growing through afflictions. Growing through afflictions. Uh, the film, uh, The Man in the Iron Mask, tells the story of a man who was locked in prison in the 17th century in France. Uh, he was forced to wear a huge iron mask to hide his face, to hide his identity. Uh, the man in the iron mask was named Felipe. Uh, he was the twin brother of the king. And so Felipe is forced to wear the mask to hide his identity so that he would not be a threat to the king's reign. The kingdom of France is facing bankruptcy at this time uh, from King Louis XIV's war against the Dutch. Uh, and even at this time, the citizens were living in poverty, but there was still uh, this ongoing war that was taking place. And as the country moves towards revolution, King Louis spends his time seducing countless women. But a group of men, some of you may know him as the Three Musketeers, they helped Felipe escape from prison, adopt the king, and replace him with his twin brother. So Felipe goes on to rule France as king without anyone knowing. He became one of the greatest kings in the history of that nation. In the middle of the story, when Felipe is wearing that iron mask and languishing in prison, he doesn't know why this is happening to him. He doesn't even know that he has a twin brother in the king. And he doesn't know if he will ever be released. And while he don't know all of these things, the author of the screenplay, the author of the movie, knew that Felipe's suffering would prepare him to be a great king. So you have to understand the difference between our perspective and Jesus' perspective is like the difference between a story's character and the author. The character experienced the story as it unfolds without knowing the end. The author experiences the story as a whole. He knows the beginning, he knows the middle, and he knows the end all at once. And he knows how what is happening in the middle of the story is preparing the characters for the end of the story. See, when we suffer, we can feel like Felipe. We don't know why this is happening to us. We have no idea when it's going to end or how it could possibly do us any good. But because Jesus is the author of our story, he knows how it ends because he has an eternal perspective. He knows how our suffering is refining us in the furnace of affliction. Jesus sees how it is building our character and preparing us for what is to come. Scripture put it this way in Isaiah chapter number 46, verses 9 through 10. Remember the former things, those of long ago. I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times what is still to come. I say my purpose will stand, and I will do all that please me. The truth about adversity, the truth about affliction, the truth about trials and tribulations are simply this. All of us will have our fair share of them. 
And while we are in the midst of experiencing the effects, the sufferings, and the heartaches that stems from these calamities, it is often difficult to see any good that can possibly come forth out of what we have to endure. However, over time, when we look back at a particular challenging and burdensome situation that no longer plagues us, it is in hindsight that we are able to discover that we indeed were able to grow through those afflictions. Martin Lloyd-Jones had this to say about affliction, and I quote, Christian people are generally at their best when they are in the furnace of affliction and being persecuted and tried. Trials and tribulations are very good for us in that they help us to know ourselves better than we knew ourselves before. Another theologian said it this way, Matthew Henry, he said, Afflictions are sent for this end, to bring us to the throne of grace, to teach us to pray and to make the word of God's grace precious to us. Many are taught with the briars and the thorns of affliction that would not learn otherwise. Both of these quotes help us to come to this conclusion, that there are some things that we learn from going through afflictions that we would not have known had we not gone through what we went through. Okay, let, let, me, let me give you a shorter, more popular version of what I just said. Uh, the seasoned saints will say it this way. If we never had a problem, we would not know that God could solve them. And this is the attitude of the psalmist in our text this morning. We read verse 67, but allow me now to look at verses 65 through 72 so that we can get a complete understanding of what he is saying. Here's what it says. It says, Thou hast dealt well with thy servant, O Lord, according unto thy word. Teach me good judgment and knowledge, for I have believed thy commands. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I have kept thy word. Thou art good and doest good. Teach me thy statutes. The proud have forged a lie against me, but I will keep thy precepts with my whole heart. Their heart is as fat as grease, but I delight in thy law. Here's the verse you all know. It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. The law of thy mouth is better unto me than thousands of gold and silver. Many scholars believe that this particular psalm is written by King David. And it is in this writing that he admits that he was going down the wrong path and that he was headed in the wrong direction before he was afflicted. But after he was afflicted, he said, I kept thy word. I believe that many of us can identify with the experience of the psalmist here because we also have found ourselves headed in the wrong direction at times. And the only reason we were able to get back on the right track was because of the afflictions that made us put things back in their proper perspective. You, you don't have to admit it to me, but the truth of the matter is there, there, there have been certain things that we have done and certain actions that we have taken uh, that caused us to find ourselves dealing with trials and tribulations that the Lord allowed to take place so that it would cause us to draw closer to him. Or in some cases, to come back. To him. I know all of us deep, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost, but if the truth be told, I'll tell it. It's been a long two years for this pandemic. And, and in the beginning, everybody was hyped about watching online. Everybody was missing church. Everybody couldn't wait until we opened the doors back up. But after about six months, you still had the computer on, but you were standing over the stove. You still had the computer on but you was listening while you washed your car. You still had your computer on. And now all of a sudden, you didn't miss church like you used to miss church. And now that the doors are open, it's going to get tight. Don't, 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 don't log off. W which camera? This one. Don't log off. This is not an attack on you because there are some people who still feel it's best that they stay at home. I'm not talking to those who have some pre-existing uh, pre conditions. I'm not talking to those who can't get out right now. I'm talking about those who started out missing church. And now because they have not been in church, no longer desire church, 
And so they cut it on to fake church. I'm talking to those who, who can't come to church but go to Walmart during rush hour. Let me get back on this side. I'm talking to those who can't make it to church but you at every sporting event that go on in town. And so God now has to allow some things to happen that will make us put things back in proper perspective. I'm not judging you. I promise you. I'm speaking from experience. Watch this, because I was here every Sunday still preaching, but it still wasn't the same without you. Ooh. God says there are some things that will happen in your life that otherwise, if they had not happened, you wouldn't draw close to me like you are now. I, I don't delight to see you in this, but, but you started to go astray. So I had to lead you to your own devices. And if I leave you to your own devices enough, sooner or later, you'll start singing, draw me close to you. <laughs> Never let me go. All right, here we go. We have all been there. And if it was not for those trials, if it was not for those tribulations, if it was not for those afflictions, many of us would still be headed in the wrong direction. And now when you look back at some of those things you had to go through, you can now say, as the psalmist said in verse 71, it was good for me that I was afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. This, this type of statement can only be made when you stop throwing a pity party and start planning a praise party. This type of statement can only be made when you stop playing the role of a victim and begin to declare yourself the victor. This type of statement can only be made when you understand that you are able to grow through your afflictions. And if you're going to grow through your afflictions, the first thing we need to do is recognize that there is a conclusion to our plight. That's my first point this morning. If you're taking notes. If we're going to grow through our afflictions, we need to recognize that there is a conclusion to our plight. When David says, it is good for me that I was afflicted, uh, he is not saying that the affliction in and of itself is good. Uh, but what he is saying is that the pain and the suffering uh, that he felt from this affliction was so overbearing and so burdensome uh, that he had to turn to the word of God for reassurance in order to endure the pain. Remember, verse 71, he said, it's good for me that I've been afflicted that I might learn thy statutes. Notice that it did not say that I might read your statutes. I'm already out here, so I may as well keep going. Uh, see, the problem with a lot of Christians is we are satisfied with just reading his word. But he didn't say that I might read your, he said that I might learn your words. See, there is a difference in reading the Word of God versus learning the Word of God. In reading the Word of God, you can just pick it up, find a verse that may motivate you for the day, and go about your business. But to learn his Word, you don't just pick it up for a pick-me-up, but you dig into it. You rehearse it, you research it, and you record it in your heart. Let me say it one more time. When, when you're trying to learn his word, you don't just pick it up for a pick-me-up, but you dig into it, and you rehearse it, you research it, and you record it in your heart and in your mind. And there is nothing that will cause you uh, to study the word of God uh, like hardship and pain. Uh, there is nothing that will cause you to rehearse the word, uh, research the word, uh, and record the word uh, like adversity and affliction. We see proof of this even when you look back in Psalm 119 verses 57 through 61. Uh, here's what David said. Thou art my portion, O Lord. I have said that I will keep thy word. I entreated thy favor with my whole heart. Uh, be merciful unto me according to thy word. I thought on my ways and turned my feet unto thy testimonies. I made haste and delayed not to keep thy commandments. The bands of the wicked have robbed me, but I have not forgotten thy law. David is starting to see a conclusion to his plight. 
he is starting to see some good in his affliction. See, here's what David is trying to get us to understand when he says it's good for me that I've been afflicted. He is trying to convey to us uh, that afflictions, his afflictions uh, made him study the word. Uh, His afflictions made him keep the word. And although it didn't feel good while he was going through it, uh, he can look back on it now and say that it was good uh, because now he can gauge the growth uh, and the strength uh, that came through his adversity. Many of us have the same testimony that David has. Because it was not until we had our own trials and tribulations that we had to learn the word. It was not until we went through our own afflictions that we began to study the word diligently. It wasn't until we had our own hardships and our own heartaches that we vowed to keep the word of God and to live according to its statutes. Can I tell you something that a lot of people don't know? It's just between me and you. Because everybody don't know this. A lot of people don't know that the anointing that's on someone's life to preach the way they preach and to sing the way they sing and to pray the way that they pray and to lead the way that they lead and to serve the way that they serve, uh, that anointing did not just magically appear, but that anointing was birthed out of affliction. That anointing uh, was birthed out of hardship. That anointing was birthed uh, out of adversity. See, sometimes uh, before God can allow you to preach about bouncing back uh, from a setback, uh, he has to put you through a setback. Uh, Sometimes before God allows you to sing uh, about coming out of the wilderness, uh, you're going to have to go through a wilderness experience. Uh, Sometimes uh, before God God allows you to pray for those uh, that have a broken heart. uh, You're going to have to experience a broken heart. Uh, Sometimes God has to allow you uh, to go through some things uh, so that you get when you get where he's taking you, uh, you are able to minister through the anointing. Watch this. It's okay sometimes to be empathetic. But then there are times when empathy won't do. A family needs to see your sympathy. They they, they need to, watch this, they don't need to know that you can only imagine how it feels. But they need to know that you know exactly how it feels. You ain't the only one that's been through a divorce. Your family's not the only family that's been sitting on the front row. Your family's not the only family that has had to lose a job. When you have been through something, you can minister better to people. And that's what makes the difference. I can get up here and hit every note on the scale, rip, run, all that good stuff. But if I don't have an anointing on my life, when I'm done, you'll just clap your hands. But when there's an anointing on your life, and when you're singing about your life experiences, and when you're preaching about your life experiences, it don't just go on a hand clap. But watch this, it pierces the heart. It pierces the soul. It makes people take a look. It makes people say, I feel a conviction. I know what he's talking about. So that's why you can look back and say it was good for me. It didn't feel good in the struggle. But now it feels good when I can look back at the struggle and say through it all. So I don't want you to get it misconstrued. I'm not telling you that you should thank God for the hurt. But I'm telling you that you should thank God through the hurt. Because what you're making it through, others did not make it. Oh, I got to move on. If it was not for the affliction, I wouldn't preach the way I preach. If it were not for my affliction, I wouldn't pray the way that I pray. If it were not for my affliction, I wouldn't serve the way that I serve. If it were not for my affliction, I wouldn't lead the way that I lead. There's something to be said about coming through affliction. And when you come through, You can say God had to draw me closer to him. And now I understand the psalmist when he said, the Lord has chastened me sore, but he has not given me over to death. So open to me the gates of righteousness, and I will go into them, and I will praise the Lord, the gate of the Lord into which the righteous shall enter. I will praise thee, for thou hast heard me and art become my salvation. The conclusion of our plight is that God uses our afflictions to draw us closer to him and to know him better through his word. And when I recognize this conclusion to my plight, I am able to grow through my affliction. Second thing that we must do in order to grow through our affliction is to recognize that there is comfort in the process. Still in the text, 
Here's what it says, verses 81 through 84. It says, my soul faints for thy salvation, but I hope in thy word. Mine eyes fail for thy word, saying, when wilt thou comfort me? For I am become like a bottle in the smoke. Yet do I not forget thy statues. How many are the days of thy servant? When wilt thou execute judgment on them that persecute me? David recognizes the fact that it's good for him to be afflicted because he can learn God's statutes. However, in these verses, he is now learning that just because you are starting to see the good that may come from your afflictions, and just because you are turning to the word to help you guide, to help guide you through your afflictions, it does not exempt you from your time of being afflicted. I, I don't want to preach this magical sermon that when you start going through afflictions, that once you start reading the word and once you start learning the word, that the afflictions go away. He said, how long before you execute righteousness? How, how long are the days of your servant? He says, I'm reading your word, but I'm still being afflicted. Oh, that sounds like an oxymoron because we shout about the affliction and how it's good for us, but he's still trying to figure out how long I got to deal with it, though. See, can I be real with you? You can shout all you want because God has been good to you in the midst of your afflictions. That don't mean you want to stay in them. And so watch this. The psalmist is realizing that there is still a process that has to take place in order for God to shape you and mold you into the vessel that he desires for you to become. These things don't just happen overnight, but you have to decide that no matter how long things may take, that I am going to wait on the Lord. But I like what David says. He says, my soul waits for thy salvation, but I hope in your word. Here's what I love about God. Even when he allows us to go through adversity and even when he allows us to go through afflictions and hardship, he still gives us hope. And not just hope, but he also gives us comfort. Still in the text, Psalm 119, 49 through 52 says this, Remember the word unto thy servant upon uh, thou hast caused me to hope. This is my comfort in my affliction. For thy word has quickened me. The proud have had me greatly in derision. Yet have I not declined from thy law. I remember thy judgments of old, O Lord, and have comforted myself. Uh-oh. I told you. I'm out here. Might as well stay out here. David said, even though I'm going through these afflictions, even though I'm dealing with this adversity, even in the midst of my hardships, the word of God has given me hope and comfort. But then he says, after remembering what I've read, I comforted myself. Ooh, that, that, that don't go over too well in the church. Because the church likes to blame everybody else for them being in the position they're in. I've been down here in this hospital for two weeks, and ain't nobody came to see me. Uh, Ma'am, sir, the pandemic is going on. And I learned not to run to a fire, but run away from it. Ain't a fireman. Nobody been by my house in almost a year to check on me. We are all quarantining. It sounds funny, but I'm going to tell you how the enemy works. It's bad enough that you're out of church, but he don't want you to settle for just being out of church. He wants you to also blame the church. And so now what happens is nobody called me when this happened. And nobody called us when that happened. And nobody, can I tell you something? In these two years, all of us have had something to happen. But David said, watch this. I read your word. And when I read your word, it didn't just give me hope and comfort, but I ended up comforting myself. Here it is. In this season of adversity and in this season of affliction, you had better learn how to encourage yourself. 
If your friend get too busy to comfort you, uh, and if your church members don't get by to comfort you, uh, and if your deacon or pastor haven't made it by to comfort you, uh, that's not the time for you to get an attitude uh, and do away with every relationship that you built. Uh, but that is when you have to encourage yourself uh, in the Lord. Uh, you got to learn how to get a prayer through on your own. Uh, you got to learn how to strike up a praise and worship song on your own. Uh, you got to learn how to magnify and lift up the Lord on your own. Uh, because there comes a time. That your friends can't make it. It's going to come a time when your deacon can't make it. It's going to come a time that your pastor can't make it. The Bible said that David encouraged himself in the Lord. But here's what I like about it. Watch this. Not only do you have to encourage yourself in the Lord, but God has designed this thing so that even when no one else may come and comfort you, you are still never without a comforter. Ooh. Here's what the Bible says. Jesus said this in John 14, verses 15 through 18. If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the spirit of truth whom the word cannot, world cannot receive because it sees him not, neither knows him. But you know him for he dwells with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Woo! Can I tell you why some of you can't find comfort? Because when you don't see your deacon, when you don't see your pastor, when you don't see your friend, you get frustrated and the enemy comes in and have a field day and calls you not to see Jesus. Let me be clear. I'm not saying that the pastor shouldn't see about you. And I'm not saying that the deacon shouldn't see about you. And I'm not saying that your friends should not see about you. All I'm saying is if they don't. What have you spent this whole time in your relationship with Jesus doing? If you've been in church half a second and can't comfort yourself, you might need to tarry adult. We've gotten to the point that we want everybody to do everything for us. Jesus said, watch this. I got to go away, but I'm going to pray to Father that he sends you another comforter. What does that mean, Pastor? When you don't see your friend, look for another comforter. When you don't see your deacon, Look for another comforter. When you don't see your pastor, look for another comforter. And can I tell you the name of that other comforter? He is the Holy Spirit. So while God may not exempt us from going through adversity and affliction, he still provides us with comfort and a hope that will see us through our afflictions. With an S. Notice that I said our afflictions and not just our affliction. Because the reality is that there is not just one affliction that we can overcome and then be who God called us to be. But there are other afflictions that we'll still, we will still have to overcome because it is all a part of our process to continue evolving and growing spiritually. David said it this way. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. But the Lord delivers him out of them all. He keeps all his bones. Not one of them is broken. Evil shall slay the wicked. And they that hate the righteous shall be desolate. The Lord redeems the soul of his servants. And none of them that trust in him shall be desolate. Many are the afflictions. The afflictions will come. But just know that you have a comforter. In the process, so as we continue with our process of evolving and growing spiritually, we will continue to have to deal with afflictions, but the good news is that the Lord will deliver us from them all. It may not happen overnight. It may not happen the way we want it to happen. But we have to have a made-up mind that no matter how long it takes, I'm going to wait on the Lord. So even though my process may not be pleasant, I know that if I continue to look to the Lord and hold to his unchanging hand, that I will find comfort and hope even in this process. And then, when it's all over, I'll be able to look back on every affliction and still declare that it was good for me that I was afflicted 
So even while you're dealing with this affliction in this season, I want to encourage you to keep trusting in God. Even through this affliction, and even though it may not feel good, if you stick with the process, sooner or later you will see that what the devil meant for evil, God meant it for good. So wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. And he will strengthen thine heart. The psalmist said, my soul faints for thy salvation, but I hope in thy word. If we're going to grow through our afflictions, we must recognize that there is a conclusion to our plight. Secondly, we must recognize that there is comfort in our process. And then lastly, we must recognize that there is a commitment to our promise. There is a commitment. Look at verse 89 through 92 and we out of here. It says, forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Thy faithfulness is unto all generations. Thou hast established the earth, and it abideth. They continue this day according to thine ordinances. For all are thy servants, and unless thy law had been my delight, I should then have perished in my affliction. Okay, because I know the King James Version is kind of hard to understand at times. Allow me a moment to read this to you in the New Living Translation so I can get one amen. Here's, here's what it say in the New Living Translation. Your eternal word, O Lord, stands firm in heaven. Your faithfulness extends to every generation. As enduring as the earth you created. Your regulations remain true to this day, for everything serves your plan. If your instructions had not sustained me with joy, I would have died in my misery. Is that anybody's testimony today? If it had not been for the Lord, I would have died. If it had not been for the Lord, it would have took me out. If it had not been. I love this because it helps me to understand that regardless of what I'm going through, and despite all of the trials and tribulations, and despite all of my afflictions, everything that God has promised me is still going to come to pass. Out of all of my afflictions, God is still committed to the promise he made me. I may have to cry sometimes, but it doesn't change God's promises to me. Because the Bible says, for all the promises of God in him are yea and in him, amen, unto the glory of God by us. And because we understand that there is a commitment by God concerning his promises to us, we now understand that everything that happens to us serves God's purpose for us. And now we can relate to the Apostle Paul when he said these words, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair persecuted but not forsaken cast down but not destroyed always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our bodies that's enough to make you shout that's enough to make you run but he didn't stop there but he continued on to say for all things are for your sakes that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God for which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, it works for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, because the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. I got to get ready to take my seat, but I need to remind somebody today that's dealing with affliction. I need to remind somebody today that's going through some adversity. I need to remind somebody today that's experiencing trials and tribulations. And my reminder to you is simply this. 
trouble don't last always. I know that you cried many tears because of your affliction, but let me give you another reminder. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy, joy comes in the morning. I know it may not feel good right now. I know that it may not seem worth it right now. I know that it seems like it's more than you can bear. But if you'll just hold on, God will see you through. Well, Pastor, I hear what you're saying. I know you say I need to hold on because God will see me through. But Pastor, how can you be so sure that God is going to see me through. Uh, the reason that I'm sure uh, that God will see you through uh, is because uh, I've had uh, many tears and sorrows. Uh, I've had uh, many questions for tomorrow. Uh, there's been times uh, I didn't know right from wrong, uh, but in every situation, uh, God gave me blessed. Uh, consolations uh, that my trials uh, only come uh, to make me strong uh, through it all uh, yeah uh, through it all uh, I learned uh, to trust in Jesus uh, and I learned uh, to trust in God uh, is there anybody who's ever had to trust him uh, is there anybody who's ever had to lean on him uh, can I ask you a question? Won't the Lord come through if you know that the Lord will come through? Open up your mouth and shout, yes, yes, yes. I know the Lord will make a way somehow. Your afflictions and your adversities are not going to last forever and they are not designed to break you down but they are designed to build you up but it's in those moments that you got to remember that this is only temporary which means that in the midst of your adversity people may not see just how anointed you are in the midst of your adversity people may not see how strong you are in the midst of your adversity people may not see how committed you are but when it gets to that point don't get discouraged just look at them and say please with me God 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 is not through with me yet but when God when God when God when he is through with me I shall I shall come forth as pure gold look at somebody and say neighbor I may not look like much now but wait until God is done with me look at your other neighbor say neighbor it's a little rough right now because I'm in the hand of the potter and when the potter looks at the clay and don't see what he desires to see he has to slam it back on the wheel. I might be on the wheel, but at least he still has his hand on me. I don't know who I'm talking to, and I don't know what your affliction may be, but I need you to know that if your affliction is sickness and disease, stand on the word because his word says he was wounded for my transgressions he was bruised for my iniquities the chastisement of my peace 
was upon him and with his stripes I am healed. Maybe your affliction is in money and finances. Stand on the word. His word says my God shall supply all of my need according to his riches in glory. Maybe your affliction is stress and anxiety. Stand on his word. His word says he'll keep thee in perfect peace all whose mind is stayed on him. I gotta go because I don't like lying and I said we was going to leave but I need somebody just to take about 10 seconds to thank God for your afflictions. Why am I thanking God for my afflictions? Because every time I look back he keeps on doing great things for me. Every time I think about how he showed up and showed out, I can't help but to wave my hands. When I think about how I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peace for sure, very deeply staying within, I was sinking to rise no more, but, 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 but the master of the sea, he heard, he heard, oh shucks, he heard my despairing cry, and from the water, he lifted me, now safe am I, it was good for me, that I was afflicted. Because if I had not been afflicted, I wouldn't know him the way I know him. <laughs> if I had not been afflicted, I wouldn't serve him the way that I serve him. If I had not been afflicted, I would not praise him the way that I praise him. When you think about all he's brought you through, you ought to be able to shout heaven down because you know beyond the shadow of a doubt that if it had not been for the Lord who was on my side, where would I be? There's some good that come from these afflictions. There's some good that comes from your adversity. There's some good that comes from your trials and your tribulations. And I know that while you're in the midst of it, it don't feel good. But I've come to discover that Jesus will never leave you, nor will he forsake you. So when it seems like you can't handle your afflictions, and when it seems like you can't handle your adversity, have a little talk with Jesus. Tell him all about your troubles. He'll hear your faintest cry, and he'll answer by and by. Feel a little prayer wheel turning. Know that the fire's burning. Just a little talk with you. Makes it up. We don't sing like that no more. But it doesn't mean that it's not true. Every once in a while, instead of complaining to everybody else who cannot do anything about it, still away in your secret closet. And even if you don't know what to say, just say, Lord, you know. If you don't know what else to say, just say, Lord, help. If you don't know what else to say, Lord, I need you. 
And I promise you, he'll understand exactly what you're saying. And not only will he understand it, but he will move on your behalf. I'm done. If you're not standing already, please stand to your feet all over the building. Y'all can come on.